What's going on YouTube? My name is Lee Brand. I'm a developer advocate here at Okta. Today we're going to talk about document databases. We're going to talk about MongoDB. Um, document databases have become increasingly popular over the past few years. Um, they're really good for their speed and their ability to store large amounts of kind of semi-structured or even unstructured data. If you need to get up to speed with uh, getting to a MongoDB source from .NET, today we got you covered. Let's get started. Okay, so the first thing we're going to need to do is scaffold out the application. Now I'm going to show this on a Mac. Um, it works just the same way on Linux. On Windows, you can just open up Visual Studio and file new project. Um, so I want to show this on an operating system that doesn't have all quite all those bells and whistles yet. So let's take a look at just the command line here. Um, we're going to start by creating a new application. And this is my .NET new MVC. We're uh, not going to use HTTPS, so we don't have to have a local uh, a local de developer certificate. And uh, we're going to put this out into a folder called Okta Netcore Mongo MVC Mongo example in case you needed a really really long folder somewhere on your system if you if you don't have one of those already. Um, <clears throat> so once this is all done, we can uh, change directories over into that folder. And we can see it scaffolded it up, our basic application. All right. <clears throat> now we need a couple of uh, packages here. So let's go ahead and add those as well. Um, if you're on Visual Studio proper, you can just go into your NuGet package manager and uh, do that. But here we're going to add this package, the MongoDB driver. Um, we're using 2.10.4. That's the latest as of this writing, um, or this video, I suppose. Um, and then we're also going to add another package that is the OpenID Connect package from Microsoft that we'll be using for the authentication piece. And this is just Microsoft ASP.NET Core Authentication OpenID Connect. We're using version 3.1.4. So we'll go ahead and add that package. And this just allows us to use OIDC protocols, um, all the stuff that you're going to need in a Visual Studio application to make it use OIDC. So um, yeah, now everything's scaffolded, everything's ready to go, and we can actually start setting up the database cluster now. All right, to get started with uh, MongoDB, we need to set up the database. Um, just go to mongodb.com. And you can go to sign in or sign up. Um, I just signed up with my Gmail account. And once you get logged in, this is the page you'll be taken to. This shows you your clusters. Now, there's only one by default, cluster zero. Now, if I go to collections, it will show me all the databases and collections that I have in this cluster, which is none. Okay, so if I want to create my own database, I would just go in here and say, add my own data. We'll call this suggest me and we'll call the collection submissions. And we'll go ahead and create that collection. And now on the C, we'll see we've got the suggest me database with the submissions collection in it. So now we have a data store that we can go ahead and save data to. All right. So now that you've got your uh, database set up, you're going to want to create a uh, database user that you can use. It'll create an admin one for you, but if you're like me, you've gone through Gmail and it's just easier to just go ahead and set up another database user. So click on database access and then go over here to add new database user. We're going to use password as the authentication method and we'll just call this web app and we'll set the password to something super secure. And we'll leave it as read and write to any database, but I'm going to set up the database user to only live for a day. So once we go ahead and add this user, now that user can access that database. So then when we come up here to clusters and we go to connect, 
we're going to connect our application is what we're going to want to do and it'll give us this connection string and we can go ahead and copy that and we can add it to our app settings over in our application so let's go do that okay now that we've got that let's go ahead and set up our database connection so come over here and we'll cut and paste our code in here so we've got our mongodb connection string that we're going to want to get from uh that we just got from the settings in uh, Mongo. Let me copy those again, come back, and we'll just replace that connection string right here. Now we'll see DB name in here. So let's replace DB name with suggest me. That's our database name. We've got our username and password, web app. And my super secure password. Okay, so now we've got this MongoDB serve, the whole connection string, we've got the database we've changed, and the username and password. So now we can actually connect to our database. The next thing we're going to want to do is we're going to want to write some code that actually gets those database settings and brings them into this, our services so that we can actually connect to the Mongo database and read and write to it. So we'll do that next. So the next thing we're going to want to do is we're going to want to create some classes that will get our connection string working correctly. So what we'll do is over in our models folder, we'll create a new model called database settings. And we'll get some code to plug in there so you don't have to sit and watch me type it. I'll cut and paste it from my clipboard here. And so what we've got here is we've got an interface and a class that's going to implement that database. <clears throat> the only reason we're really doing this for an interface, um, not, not only because it's best practice, but because we're going to be injecting the database settings into our controllers. So we're going to want an interface that we can use as a placeholder that the database settings then can then be um, injected into. So really just we get the connection string and the database name that will be coming from here. All right? Okay. So now that's saved. The next thing we need to do is wire it up so it'll actually be um, used. So over in our startup.cs we're going to add a couple of lines to the configure services right at the top before the add with controllers. So we're going to get database settings. I'll bring in the model's namespace so that it can do that. And there's some other namespaces that might need to be brought in for the options. So now, format this document. Now, I've configured the database settings by getting the section out of, out of the app settings, the database settings section, out of app settings, and put them into this database settings object. That will then be injected as a singleton anytime somebody requires iDatabase settings interface We'll go ahead and get the database settings and pass them in. So now we're all set up to connect to our database. So let's start doing that. Okay, so the last thing we need to do here before we start saving stuff to the database is we need to create a model that's going to model what our data should look like in that collection. So we'll create a new file. We'll call it submissions. That's what our collection is called. And uh, yeah, so there's a couple of things we brought in was the MongoDB BSON, which is um, binary JSON. It's how it stores the object and the object ID. So um, that's why we have these, where we get these attributes from, this BSON ID and the BSON representation of an object ID. Just lets um, .NET know how to handle the ID that's coming back. 
Um, and then we've got user, user ID, username, content, which is the submission they're going to create, the suggestion that we're going to, they're going to send um, when it was created and when it was last updated. Okay, so now we've got our object. We've got our startup that's going to be injecting our database settings into all of our controllers. We've got our database settings object so we can pull data out of the app settings object. Now it's finally time to get down to connecting to MongoDB and uh, creating, saving, updating, and deleting these submissions to our suggestions app. All right, so to make things easier, we're actually going to create a service here and inject the database settings and the database connection stuff into the service. This will make the controllers a lot leaner and it'll kind of separate out um, our database logic a little bit and allow us to quickly uh, substitute in a different type. We just go to the core of the uh, application. We'll create a new folder called services. And inside the services folder, we're going to create a new file and we're going to call it submission service with just one C. And here's the content. So we're going to get our MongoDB driver and we're going to bring in our models that we created, the submission, so we have access to the submission object. <clears throat> and I'm going to create an iMongo collection right here at the top of the submission service. Um, that is an iMongo collection of type submissions. Um, then we've got our constructor here for the service that takes in the iDatabase settings, which is going to get injected with the actual database settings and allow us to create a new Mongo client with the connection string. We're going to be able to get the database from the settings, the database name, and then we're going to be able to get the collection called submissions and save them into submission objects. Then we've got our create, read, find, update, and delete methods that basically just take that submissions collection and either insert one and then returns that submission, <clears throat> finds one based on um, the sub that we've listed. Oh, this one reads. So this one gets all of the submissions. So we're going to do a find where the uh, subject of this is actually just true. So find all of them. And we're going to put them in a list. In this one, we're going to look at the submissions. We're going to find where the ID is equal to the ID that gets passed in. And we're going to get a, going to get a single or default, default being null if it doesn't find one. <clears throat> um, submissions, we're going to replace one. So we're going to up for the update, we're going to replace one. Based on the ID we pass in, we want to replace it with the submission that you just sent in. So that's how our update's going to go, is it's going to be just replace the one that's already there with this one. So it doesn't change the ID, just changes all the other information. So that just means that we're going to make sure, we're going to need to make sure that when we pass in a submission here, that it has all the data. Because if we leave data off, because like maybe there was some information that was already there that we don't want to change, can't do that. We're replacing the whole thing. So um, same thing with the delete. We're just going to go and delete one wherever that ID matches the ID passed in. Pretty straightforward, create, read, update, and delete. Okay, so here's our service and it's all set up. Now we can actually use this service in our controllers. So let's do that next. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna to wanna to do is create a controller that will consume this submission service. So we'll come over here into the controllers, we'll add a new file, we'll call this submission controller. And here's the contents of that. So you'll see there's an authorize header on there. We're going to add authentication to this, mostly so that um, anybody can view the list of suggestions that are out there, but only the people who submitted that suggestion can edit it or update it, right? Or delete it. So we'll add some authentication to it here in a minute. Um, but we're going to bring in the submission service. It's going to get injected with just one line of code that we need to add here in just a second. But we've got our submission service that's going to come in. And then we've got this allow anonymous. And that's our index action. And all it's going to do is return the, the view for the index view. 
and it's going to do the submission service read, which is basically this guy here that's going to return all the submissions from the collection, right? Then we've got our create action that's just going to return the view, an empty view, and that's the HTTP get create action. And then we've also got an HTTP post with an anti-forgery token so that we don't get a man in the middle attack between sending the view out to somebody and the submission that gets sent back to the controller. And the uh, action result's going to be the action result with the submission in it. Um, the create's gonna take a submission in. It's going to get the created and last, dated, last updated date to date time now, okay? <clears throat> We're gonna set the user ID to whatever the currently logged in user's first uh, first claim type that looks like name identifier, that's the value we want to get. <clears throat> so that's the user ID. The name identifier is the ID, the user ID that gets stored in Okta. And our username is going to be the user identity.name, which will get populated for us from Okta once they're signed in, which we'll see in just a minute. We want to make sure the model state is valid, and if it is, then we want to just go ahead and run the create action on the sub, uh, submission service. We want the create function passing in that submission. And then we want to redirect to the index action. Then we've got an HTTP get here that is the uh, edit submission, which is just going to return the view with the submission that you find. So it's going to call the submission service and say, find the one with this ID and return it to that view, the edit view. Then we've got our, again, our edit, that's the get. We've got our HTTP post with our any forgery token. We've got our edit that's going to take in a submission. And it's going to set the last dated, last updated date to date time now. It's also going to set the created date to the submission.created.toLocal time. Now this may seem a little weird, but what ends up happening is whenever you save the object to MongoDB, it's going to convert the date time that you sent it to GMT and then allow you to change it back to local time when you get it. And that's the reason. So we're updating one here. We want to take the created date that was originally saved to the database, which was a GMT date time. And we want to set it to local time so that when we go and save it again, because remember, we're replacing the whole thing. We don't want MongoDB to take our local our our GMT time that we got from it to begin with and commit it to and and try and um, change that to GMT because what it's going to do is it's going to see that I'm at GMT minus six I think and it's going to take whatever date time I send in and subtract six hours and I don't want it to do that so we want to make sure that the model state is valid we also want to make sure that whoever's trying to edit this has permission to. So we look and see in the user claims if the user ID is not equal to the submissions user ID. So the submission that you're editing right now, if the ID of the currently logged in user doesn't match the ID of the submission, it's just going to return a 401 author, an author, unauthorized um, page. So otherwise, just go ahead and run the regular submission service update with that submission and then redirect to the index page again. Um, otherwise, if it isn't valid, then go ahead and return the view uh, with the submission in it. And then we've got delete that's just going to delete based on that ID and redirect to action. Honestly, we probably should have a, uh, a check here to make sure that the ID is equal to but we don't actually have the submission here. We only have the ID. So we'll have to do that check on the way in. So we're just not going to give them the user ID um, available to do that. So now we have our submission set up. The very last thing we need to do to make sure that it gets injected in there is we're going to add to our configuration and make sure that we have that uh, submission service being injected in just like we did with the database settings. So we'll just go to the end of this line. We'll add another line here that just adds the submission service 
which we'll need to bring in that using statement so it knows what the submission service actually is. And so we're just going to inject that into anybody who needs it. So now this thing is all set up and ready to go. The only exception is we haven't uh, um, implemented any login or anything so that we have user information that we can store in the database and use to check to see if they can actually edit those ones. So um, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to add some views and then we'll add the user authentication. So now that we've got that, we need some views to, to hook up to this controller. And the last thing we're going to do is add the user authentication. So let's go ahead and add our views. And in our views folder, we're just going to create a new folder in here called submission to match our submission controller. So here's our submission folder. And we need a new couple of files in here. We'll do the index.cshtml. That's number one. And here's our code for that. We're going to tell it that the model is going to be an IEnumerable of submissions. So we're going to get a list of submissions. And we're just going to loop through each one of them and, um, and spit them out to the screen. Now, this is our security for the front side, for our UI. This is user.identity.isAuthenticated. And the claims first or default where the name identifier claim type is equal to the user ID of the submission, then show them the edit and the delete button. Okay. And we've also got to create a new idea. Now, once we've got this set up, we're going to need a couple more, right? So we need one for uh, create, update, and delete, right? So, for the create.cshtml new file create.cshtml here's our code pretty straightforward it's just a form that says submit an idea and it's got a text area for the idea and a submit button that's it that's all they're actually going to be inputting the controller itself does all the rest of it putting in the who created it what their name was when they created it, when it was last updated, that's all being done by the controller. So the view doesn't actually need to know anything about it. At least the create view doesn't, okay? But we're gonna need an edit view as well. So let's create an edit.cshtml. And we're gonna get the code from for that. It's a little bit more involved. So we've got some hidden fields for the created user ID username that we want to be able to pass to the front side and back to the controller again, but we don't want the user being able to manipulate those things. And uh, because remember, when we update something, we're actually replacing the whole document in the document collection, the submissions collection. We're replacing that whole document with a brand new document. So we need to make sure that the stuff that was originally saved also gets passed through. So now we've got that. Um, the only thing left is some styling. So let's go ahead and um, just put some styling around this to make this a little bit prettier. Um, in our www root, there's a CSS site. And we'll just go to the bottom of this and we'll put in some basic styles. All I'm doing is for an idea, I'm putting borders around it, a little bit of padding and margin bottom so they look okay when they're displayed. <clears throat> the uh, Any kind of span inside there, I want to set the font size and maybe a, a color for the uh, font. Um, yeah, all these are pretty straightforward and they're straight off the blog post. So um, check it out if you want to just cut and paste that code um, or you can style it up however you like. So now that we've got a little bit of styling and we've got the views set in place, the last thing we need to do is add authentication to this so that people can log in, submit ideas, and they can edit and delete their own ideas, but they can't do that to other people's ideas. So 
Let's go and see what that looks like in Octo. All right, so the first thing we need to do is we need to tell Octo that we're going to, we're going to be using it as uh, an identity provider for this application. So if you don't already have one, you can set up an Octo free account, free developer account. All the stuff we're doing here is all included in the free account. So you just go to your dashboard. Once you get logged in, go to applications here at the top and add application. We're going to choose web because it's a basic .NET server side app. It's not uh, an Angular React uh, client side app or a native app or a, an API. So web is the one we want to choose. And we're just going to call this suggest me. And by default, it's got 8080, but we want uh, port 5000. And we're going to change this to port 5000. Okay, so for the login redirect URIs, we're going to add uh, localhost 5000 sign in dash OIDC. And for the log out redirects, we want to change this to port 5000. But we're actually going to change it to a different value. So we're going to change it to a different value other than just this plain old thing. It's going to be sign out dash callback dash OIDC. Um, that's just because that's what .NET is going to be handling for us. And authorization code, everything else that's in here, you can leave it just like it is and click done. Now, once you've done that, you'll be taken back to the general settings tab of the Suggest Me app that has all the same stuff we just put in there. But at the bottom, it's got client credentials. So we have a client ID and a client secret down here at the bottom that we're going to need here in just a minute. So now that we've created the application, we need to go back into our code and we need to add the code that will allow our application to now talk to Okta and be our identity provider. So let's do that next. Okay, now we're back in our code and we're going to go back to our app settings again and we're going to add the settings for Okta now. So we've got our client ID, client secret, our domain, and then the localhost 5000, which is the place that we'll be actually redirected to once. So we set out the post logout redirect URI in Okta that tells Okta where to come back to in our application. Now, when it gets back to our application, this URI is where our application is going to redirect you to once it's gotten the okay from Okta that you've actually been logged out. So hopefully that makes sense. Now your Okta domain, you can get right at the top of our, right at the top of your dashboard. And it's usually going to be something like dev dash something, some number dot octa dot com. Now we want our client secret that we just saw in the application itself. Our client ID that we got from that page. And the client secret. Now, once we've got that all set in, now everything's set up for us to use Okta. We just need to tell our application to use Okta. Okay, now we need to configure Okta for our application in the startup.cs. So we go into our startup.cs and right here before the add controller service with views, we're just going to pop this in here. Now there's a lot here, but a lot of it is kind of basic setup stuff. So um, we have add authentication and really that's the two pieces that we added. We added add authentication and add authorization. Those are the two services we configured for the app. Now there are some options that need to go in here. So one of them is the default scheme. The default scheme is going to be the cookie authentication scheme. And the default challenge scheme is going to be OpenID Connect defaults. That way, when we actually go into the account controller and we do a challenge, that's what's telling the challenge how to do, how to challenge the user. Okay. Now, 
Um, we're going to add a cookie, which basically means it's going to, whenever you get authenticated, it's going to add a, a cookie for the token when it gets it back. The sign-in scheme we're going to be using is cookie authentication defaults authentication scheme. We're going to, the authority that's going to be giving it to us is whatever our Octa domain is over here in app settings, our Octa domain, dev, blah, 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 dot Octa dot com. That guy plus OAuth2 slash default, because whenever you create a new um, account with Okta, it sets up a default authentication server, and that's the authority that's going to be um, giving out the token. Um, requires HTTPS metadata, true, uh, which basically just means we're going to be running um, Okta and HTTPS. Um, client ID we're going to get from our application settings. The response type we're going to be uh, expecting back is a code because we're using the authorization code flow. So it's going to get an authorization code first and then exchange that for a token. Um, it's going to get the claims from the user info endpoint. OIDC already has a well-known endpoint for getting um, user info from it. Um, so we're going to get user info from the user info endpoint. <clears throat> We're also going to add a couple of scopes, which is open ID and profile, which just means I want the open ID scope and the profile scope, which just means that I want my application to be able to access um, open ID and profile information. Um, I want to save the tokens once I get them. The token validation parameters, the name claim type is name. Um, by default, it's name with a capital N and it is case sensitive so and the role take claim type is usually roles but in this case coming from Okta for for the way I've got mine set up it's groups so I just want to make sure that roles get into groups um, you don't necessarily have to do this for this application because we're not using it <clears throat> but I use it everywhere when I use Okta because especially for .NET apps there's a lot of times that I'm building an application and I want to be able to not only make sure that someone's logged in, but in order to get to a specific page or a specific uh, uh, controller action, they have to be in a specific group. So you don't necessarily need this, um, but it's good to have. And validate issue, or you probably want to have anyway. Um, then we've got this add authorization that we've added. And the last thing we need to do is come down here and add this line, which I already had in there, but use authentication. So we've configured it up. We've configured authentication up here. We added it here. Now we're telling it down here that you wanted to use that. Um, use authorization should already be in there. Uh, the scaffolded app already has it in there, but use authentication, you're going to need to add. Now, once that's in there, the only thing really left to do is make sure that, I mean, all this will work. There's just no links to get to any of this stuff, so you have to type in the URL all the time. So let's not let's not do that. Let's go into the views. And over in our shared views, we're gonna create a new file called login partial .cshtml. And the login partial will have some code in it that will allow us to put some uh, menu items up there for for login. So this is basically just stuff that's going to go into the navigation bar and it's just going to be injected in there for us. So all this is going to do is say if they are actually logged in then just say hello whatever your name is and give them a logout button. If they are logged in or if they aren't logged in then just show the login button. Okay, <clears throat> so now we got that. The only other thing left we need to do is we need to add that to the um, layout page. So I'm going to copy this little chunk here. And it's not so self-explanatory as it might seem once I cut and paste it in there. Um, I'll show you. So if we go out to our layout partial, this is the section that we're going to replace. This div section where it's... That's, um, set with the first class of navbar collapse. We're going to replace that with navbar collapse, but we change this to justify content between because we're going to put the menu items in there for 
home and submission and privacy and all that good stuff. But we're also going to put the login partial on there and we want the regular menu items to sit here on this side and then the login partial, the uh, hello, whatever your name is with the logout button or the login button, depending on your login status, off to the right and you want to justify the, the space in between them. <clears throat> so now that that's all done, we should now be able to just run this thing and away we go. So we'll F5 to run it. If F5 doesn't run it for you, you may need to reopen the application and it'll say, hey, do you want to add the VS, that .VS code folder? Yes, we do, because that will generate all the stuff for you. Okay, now that you got the application up and running, um, there should be an ideas uh, button here at the top, menu item. There should also be a login button. So I could log in, but if I come over here to ideas, we'll see that I, I have put a couple of ideas in here just for testing purposes. You should have none. But if you run uh, add new idea, it should take you to a login page that says, oh, you got to be, you gotta log in to be able to do that. So then we just log in with our, um, you can log in with the username and password that you set up when you created the account. And that should take you back to the submitted idea page where you can add a new idea. And you can submit that idea. And we'll see some ideas here. And now that I've logged in, I've got my edit and delete buttons here. And we can go in and update that. And it'll tell me when it was updated, who it was created by. And I can delete an idea. And I can also log out. And then when I come to ideas, since I'm not logged in, it doesn't know that I'm Lee Brandt, so I can edit these two. Now, this is your application. It is now saving data to uh, MongoDB, getting data out of MongoDB, and uh, being able to update and delete data in MongoDB. So um, hopefully you enjoyed this content. If you did, smash the like button down below. Um, make sure you subscribe if you like this content. We put new content out every Tuesday and Thursday. Um, so make sure you subscribe and we'll check you next time.